But anyway, it's good. God is good, and we're going to get into it, and uh, uh, let's just pray. Father, you're so good, Lord. Lord, um, it's all about you. Amen. Lord, I pray that, um, Lord, what is going to be discussed today has been taken so far out of context, Lord, that it's, it's hindered the gospel. And uh, so I pray, Lord, that the ears and the hearts of the people would be open, Lord, to receive. Um, because, Lord, we uh, truly trust in you for all things and, and whatever it might be, Father. And, um, Lord, I just uh, I ask, Lord, that you would um, forgive those that, Lord, that have misused and represented your word in the wrong way. And, Lord, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, welcome, guys, to the Citadel Church, um, the Citadel family. It's uh, where God is, uh, where God is God. Amen. And um, so, the service today is called the Expressions of Worship. And uh, so I want to just, I'm going to read through some things, and then we're going to dive into some areas about what worship is. Since worship deals with thought, feeling, Indeed, there are many expressions of it. Worship especially includes praise and thanksgiving, which may be expressed privately or publicly, either by grateful declarations, as seen in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, or by joyful singing in Psalms 100, verse 2, also in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, uh, also in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Portions of the early Christian hymns of worship actually may be preserved in the New Testament, uh, like 1 uh, Timothy 3, 16 and 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11 through 13. And the reason I'm giving you these scriptures behind it, so those that watch it on YouTube, or you, you can go back and get them and you can write them down. One very important expression of worship for the church is remembering the death of Christ through the Lord's Supper in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse uh, 26. That is an expression of worship. We're given praise and thanksgiving for what Christ has actually done. The Lord's Supper was instituted by Christ himself in Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 through 28. And it was judged by Paul not to be taken lightly in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. And Nick, you don't have to worry about your son. He is good. Well, we, that doesn't bother us at all. Worship means giving to God. The cheerful giving of money to God's work is certainly an act of worship as well. The use of spiritual gifts that's been given to you uh, in ministry to the body of Christ constitutes worship as a service, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So these gifts that has been given to you, you know, it's actually, you know, not for you, but to be used by you to, you know, worship Christ. And it's a gift that you're bestowing upon others like, you know, Pete and, and Jason and Charlene and different people who have different gifts. It, it's, it, there's many different ways. Um, it says, the use of spiritual gifts in ministry to the body of Christ constitutes worship as a service. I mean, when you encourage someone, you know, that's a service. It's a gift that's been given to you, and you're using it to benefit the body of Christ. Um, also in... Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 13, it talks about, you know, um, gifts being used as a ministry to the body of Christ. Uh, ministry and edifying saints and evangelizing sinners both constitute services of worship. 
Um, the single most important act of worship for a Christian is the unqualified presentation of himself or herself to God as an obedient servant. I'm going to read that again. The single most important act of worship for a Christian is the unqualified presentation of himself or herself to God as an obedient servant. Because then God can use you to bless others. You understand? Amen. So the greatest gift that you can give, the greatest worship you can give to God is you. Hallelujah. Is yourself. Because when you give you or you give yourself away to God, well then, you know, He has all of you. And everything is truly about Him and what He wants and not about what it is that we want. Amen. Um, this dedication involves the body and the mind. It's talked about in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 12. Um, the body, because it contains the tools by which the will of God is carried out. Right? So God's will can only be done through you and me. That's why the body is important. The mind because it coordinates the actions to be executed by the body. That's why you constantly have to read your word to be renewed in your mind to know what it is, what is the perfect will of God for you in your life so that God can use you to bless others Amen. with the gifts that He has given you. Whatever those gifts are because we all don't contain, you know, all the gifts that are needed. When these are gladly devoted to God, they become instruments by which He affects His will on the earth. Such faithful and joyous service makes one's entire life a performance of worship. We think of worship David. We think of worship through Coming in here, some raise their hands, some don't. Um, there's all sorts, but this is only one little bitty aspect of what worship is. And whether you choose to sing to Him, or not sing, or whatever it is, you know, um, it doesn't just constitute the playing or strumming of a guitar or a piano. The acts of worship is done every day that you get up and you surrender yourself to Jesus Christ. Amen. That's true worship. Amen. A total surrender Amen. of oneself to Jesus Christ. That is, you know, like Jesus said, I've come to do the Father's will. He surrendered His self to, to God's will and that's what we must do. I want to um, go into, um, kind of show you some um, because we learn how to worship in the Old Covenant. So I want to go into the Old Covenant and show you some acts of worship in the Old Covenant and how Israel and the church are actually, you know, one and the same and how the church actually got the word church, which is ecclesia, and uh, to just show you some things. Watch this. Israel was a called out group of people to be separated unto God for His glory and honor. That's in Acts chapter 7, verse 48. Israel was a called out group of people to be separated unto God. Amen. This is the reason the word church means called out ones. Amen. That's where it came from. Understand? Israel was a called out group from amongst people that God used for His glory and His honor. Right? And so the church is called the Ecclesia, which is a people, not a building. There was no building that God called out of Egypt. He called, called out ones. He called out people to come out and do what? To worship Him. Yeah. Right? How? In body, soul, and spirit. 
That's what he required. This is the reason the word church means called out ones. Israel was called out of Egypt, and we the church, we're called out of this world, first physically, and then, um, uh, first physically, and then um, spiritually. Um, so we can learn from the original called out ones, our brothers and sisters, which is Israel. So there's, we can learn from those guys. We learn, basically, we set up a church service kind of the way they set it up in the temple back then. You know, in Solomon's temple, there was, you know, worshipers and, and uh, you know, the institution of giving and all kind of things and to feed the poor. And, and this is where the whole church gets their, their, um, their format of how we operate today as a body. So number one, I wrote, um, and I'm comparing the church with uh, the body of Christ. So uh, I'm comparing uh, the church with Israel. Israel, uh, God set them free by the blood and uh, to come into the wilderness and worship Him. The church, God set us free by the blood and calls us to go outside the city gates and worship Him, which is Christ. He died outside the city gates. That's where you get this called out ones. Israel was baptized unto Moses. The Bible says, and we are baptized unto Christ. Right? Yeah. Israel receives covenant on Pentecost. Remember, Moses came down, the, the law of God spoke to him. The church received a new covenant on Pentecost. Right? right? The Holy Spirit. Yeah. Right? Amen. Israel throws the spoils of Egypt unto idols. Right? Remember? They cast their gold into uh, the fire, and Aaron said, Out popped this golden calf. Yeah, out popped it. It was formed. That's right. It jumped out of the fire. In the church, we throw our spoils into idols that we build too. What is that? Buildings. We throw the, the, the prosperity of what God has given us into. Uh, you know, into all sorts of things. We throw it into the pleasures of the flesh. That's what we do. You know, uh, the church nowadays builds big buildings and, you know, weighs down the body and fleeces the sheep and, you know, and does all kind of things that, you know, that's the institution of man. Man builds buildings. God builds people. Amen. God required from Israel a free will offering to build the mobile tabernacle. Yeah. Right? God requires us to give a free will offering to build His mobile tabernacle, the church. Amen. Right? You see, we're building people. God didn't call me to build a big building. God called us to use the assets that we have to build people, to preach the gospel, not to use the majority of the money to, you know, buy a $68, a $68 million jet Amen. or build, you know, uh, you know, a $10 million or $20, $30 million building when that money can be focused in on people. And, but the mentality of the church today is the same mentality that Israel had back then let us build a house unto the Lord. Amen. And, you know, and decorate it with fine cedar and, and gold and silver. And, you know, and we're going to build us a great house when God's like, look, I'm not into that. You know, in fact, Jesus Amen. said, I'm going to tear that house down because the house that I'm going to build is people. But man today is still building those buildings, whether they're building a church building, a coliseum, a skyscraper. It doesn't Amen. matter. Men build. But they build the wrong building. Yeah. They need to build people, not buildings. Israel ate bread for 40 years in the wilderness. The church eats the body of Christ for 40 jubilees in the wilderness that we're in right now. We're partaken, right? I mean, it said, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness. And that's what we're doing right now today. We're eating the manna that's, you know, freely given.
right? Did they pay for any of that manner in the wilderness? No. Did God tell them to build a building out there in the wilderness? No. They was mobile. Why? Because they were seeking for a land that flowed with milk and honey, a promised land. Just like Abraham by faith, it says, you know, he believed God and he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. But he still believed God. N not even receiving the promise. He still believed God, right? That's like you and me. Are we to seek any building here in this world? No. The city in which we seek is the one that's going to come down from heaven that's already built. Amen. Right? It's already built. And believe it or not, you are that city. Each of you are a lively stone that is set, that is part of that city. It's a city that, that is alive. Amen. And your name is written in that city. Amen. That's pretty amazing, right? Yeah. It says, um, and I want to show you how that comparison of the wilderness, Israel's wilderness journey of 40 years, is symbolically uh, to our 40 jubilees or 2,000 years in our wilderness journey right now. It's an exact, we can learn from them in the wilderness. What happened? Their shoes didn't wear out, right? Because the gospel's not wearing out. They was in a mobile tabernacle. That's what the Bible says that you and I are in. We're in uh, this tabernacle of flesh that's mobile and we're, pilgrim we're on a pilgrimage, you know, looking for a city. And we're wandering right now in the wilderness. And those that believe God are going to be the ones that cross over. And I'm going to tell you something. The only ones, the ones that crossed over was only those that believed. Come on, brother. That's right. It was only those that believed. And if you think about this, all those that came out of Egypt was constantly wanting to go back. Right? Because they had things there. And, but they didn't believe God. And because they didn't believe God, it says God laid waste to them in the wilderness. Now watch. And the only two original ones that came out of Egypt that was over the age of 20 that crossed over was a man named Joshua and a man named Caleb. Right? Now, the two men that crossed over, isn't it It's kind of... God is pretty amazing that you would look at Joshua. You know his name means Jesus, right? right? And Jesus is now carrying forth the children of Israel. He's going to cross them over. We are the children of Israel. That's why I'm comparing the children of Israel, which is us, the church. It says that is our mother, right? Yeah. Israel. We're being compared to Israel because we are the children that's going to cross over with Joshua into the promised land. And God says the only two that crossed over from the original uh, Egypt from leaving uh, 40 years prior was Joshua and Caleb. Now, Joshua's name means Yeshua or Hoshea or Jesus. And Caleb's name means a wild dog. I say, Caleb's name means dog. Not a wild dog, just dog. So the two that crossed over was Joshua and his dog. Now that's kind of crazy. That is kind of crazy, right? Yeah. Why a dog? Well, it's really simple why it's a dog. Because remember Jesus said when the woman come running up to him and she was seeking healing for her child. Come on. And she cried out to him, Master, you know, and he said, Is it right to take the bread of the children and, um, and give it and throw it to the dogs? Is it right to cast it to the dogs? And he was talking to a Gentile woman. That's right. Caleb represented the Gentile church that was crossing over with Joshua. Right? Pretty amazing stuff. That's what the dog represented. A dog was unclean. But it was the dog that wanted, that was Caleb, that wanted to go back and take the mountain that was promised to him by Moses. So, um, let's keep going. The law, and the law of circumcision was not instituted while uh, in the wilderness journey nor was the tithe only a free will offering. Wow, now let's look at that. 
the tithe was not required while the children of Israel were in the wilderness. Wait, now, I mean, that's kind of, you know, crazy. Because nor was the covenant of circumcision. Because Joshua, it says that they did no circumcision while they were in the wilderness because when they crossed over into the promised land, they had to circumcise all of those children. Amen. Who were children? The children of Israel. That's you and me. That's why circumcision, physical circumcision, is not required of the body of Christ right now. Amen. Only the circumcision of the heart. Amen. Now when we cross over into the promised land, when God comes and gets us, Jesus and Him crossing over the children of Israel you know, into the promised land, the Bible says that when the Lord returns and God crosses us over, we have to lose His flesh. That's when we are physically circumcised. You with me? So there was no circumcision that was done. So the law of circumcision and the law of the tithe was not kept while they were in their wilderness journey for 40 years. Therefore, the law of the tithe is not required of you and me right now while we're in this 40 jubilees or 2,000 years waiting on Christ's return. Beyond the shadow of a doubt. Amen. But the preachers and the ministers of God today has chosen to use it because they don't understand God's Word to fleece their sheep and build their, you know, temples. Not only did God not require the tithe, and we know of that because the Bible says that as soon as they crossed over, that the manna ended. That's right. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the law, in chapter 26, the law was now instituted and he says, now when they begin to eat from the land, let them lay aside 10% that is now going to be given unto the Lord. And remember, it says that when the children of Israel crossed over and they took Jericho, he said, when you take Jericho, the, the first offering that when they cross over Jericho, he said, is mine. The first fruits of what you're doing now, when you cross over and you take Jericho, the first fruits of all that I'm giving you in the land belongs to me. Don't touch it. But we know Achan took it and hid it in his tent, his tabernacle, because he saw what was goodly. He saw the, the purple. He saw the gold and the silver and hid it under his tent, in his flesh skin. And judgment fell upon him, because the tithe belongs to the Lord. That's right. That tithe is going to be instituted again when the Lord returns in Zechariah chapter 14. It says that those that does not come to the house of God and bring what is rightly His, no rain would be uh, given to Him. You can read it in Zechariah chapter 14 that when God's throne is established in the earth and the King of kings and Lord of lords sits on His throne in Zechariah that He commands all peoples and nations to come to Him yearly and bring, a, uh, bring um, the offering back to the Lord. Yes, when the kingdom is set up again, it's going to be demanded by the people to bring it to the Lord. Right now, it is not required to bring a tithe to the Lord. The tabernacle of Moses, the mobile tent unit that God used, which was a picture of Jesus Christ, was not to require any payment because Jesus Christ was going to be the fulfillment of that payment. Right? So they required, what was required of the people when they built this this tabernacle. Moses said, let all the people bring unto God a free will offering. Amen. Right? When, when Solomon built the temple, he said, let all of those that want to, uh, to build the temple, let them bring unto Solomon and the priest a free will offering so that my house may be built. Never was it required 
that, you know, the tithe would be instituted to build the house of God. It was always free will. Why? Because Jesus came uh, free and willingly of his own self. He gave. It wasn't demanded of God. He asked, will you do this to build his house? So, the law of circumcision was not instituted while they were in the wilderness, nor was they required to give a tithe while they was in the wilderness. They gave a free will offering only. That was it. The spoils that they took from Egypt, they wasted and threw at building some calf. It's like us. The spoils that we have in life, we throw it at all kind of things other than what it's actually meant to be made for. To build the house of God. Amen. And not a building. A people. The church is not required to be circumcised, but that of the heart only. Nor are we under the law to give a tithe to the law. The institution of the tithe was not started until they crossed over into the promised land. And you can read this in Joshua chapter 1 through chapter 4. Check it out for yourself. The institution of the law of the tithe will begin for the world when the kingdom of Jesus Christ will be set up here on earth for a thousand years. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16 through 21. And we know and you know that when God comes and sets his kingdom up, we will reign as kings and priests. Wow. Wow. That means they will be bringing the tithe to us because we will be over the house of God to take care of the people. Wow. Amen. Um, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8 and 9, we read the purpose of giving. Paul lets us know. And um, I want to read this scripture. If you go to 2 Corinthians, um, but before I get to that, one thing, the tithe is mentioned six times in the New Testament. It's mentioned once in Luke and five times in Hebrews. Every time it's mentioned in Luke and in Hebrews, and you can check this out in your Hebrew Strong's Concordance. All in Hebrews, it talks about, uh, about the tithe, and Paul was referring back to the, the tabernacle, the temple. He was talking about when Paul, well, who we believe wrote uh, Hebrews. And in Luke, it talks about, you know, uh, the scripture in Luke, it says, um, Jesus said, you know, there were two men that came up, and one in worshiping God said, you know, I give, I tithe a mint, and I do this, and I do that. I'm glad I'm not like him. Yeah. And, you know, the Lord says, you know, but the other one beat his chest and said, you know, woe is me, I'm a sinner, forgive me. And, and he said, you know, you know, Jesus asks, you know, who is the one and that he's going to receive? And it's the one that is standing there that's saying, you know, forgive me, and beating his chest. And then Jesus said something. He said, you know, that... You shouldn't, you should have um, done all of those things, the tithe and all of these things, you should have done them, but you should have not have forsaken the rest. Well, there it is right there. The preachers will preach. Well, there it is. Jesus is saying to, you know, you have to pay the tithe. Well, that's incorrect because the old covenant had not been done away with yet. Jesus was there fulfilling the old covenant. So it was right for Jesus to say Amen. to pay the tithe right. But once the old covenant was abolished, I say abolished, not abolished, fulfilled. Jesus paid the price. It wasn't right. abolished. Wrong word. Forgive me. Wrong word. Jesus fulfilled it. He paid what the law required. The law required a tithe. The law required the tithe. And I'll get into the rest with uh, Melchizedek in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 7 and, and talk about that in a minute because I know you got uh, some questions about that. But if you think about this, Paul never required a tithe from any of the people. 
All the churches that he went to, he said, I work with my own hands. Right? I didn't require anything you. He said, I give unto you. Freely I've received, freely I gave to you. When he being an apostle, you know, if the tithe was still instituted, you know, why is he living with nothing? You know what I mean? Why is he not telling them that you have to pay a tithe? Because the, 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 the temple institution, Jesus said, look, this is all about to be done away with. Do you see this temple right here? Not one stone would be left unturned, right? So how can you pay a tithe if there's no temple? You understand? You can't. Well, it's with people. Well, the Bible says we're all kings and priests and we're the house of God. So, you know, are we to bring a tithe to build another temple? No. That isn't what it was being required. But watch this. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. Um, you don't have to go there. I'll read it to you. But if you want, you can. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. Um, this is Paul, and he's talking to the church of Corinth, and he says, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and in utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment. You heard me? I speak not by commandment, law, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. And the next thing he goes into is the purpose of giving. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you. That means um, this is the best for you. Who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward... Um, a year ago. You could go on and keep reading it, for, but for time's sake, Paul is talking to the church of Corinth. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 that the Corinthian church was like, we're ready to give. Whatever it is that Jerusalem needs, and you can read that in Acts chapter 20, Jerusalem was, you know, in poverty. The church over there was suffering persecution Paul talked to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and they said, Paul, when you come, we will have money laid aside for you to give to the church that's in Jerusalem. So now the second letter comes forth in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul is letting the church of Corinth know, hey, I'm about to come to you. And just as you said a year ago, that you was willing to give, I have mentioned to all the other churches that are out there, so that when I come, you know, I'm giving you a fore uh, um, knowledge of when I'm coming, so that when I come, you be not ashamed. But I told them how you was ready to give and help, so when I come, you know, that there be no gathering. Let every man lay aside, as God has blessed him, let him lay aside, you know, the first day of a week, let him lay in store so that when I get there, there be no collecting. Paul don't even want to be associated with money. Why? Because grievous wolves had entered the church and turned them into, you know, robbing and stealing and hirelings and fleecing the sheep for something they're not supposed to be doing. He don't even want to be associated with it. He doesn't even want to touch it or carry the money. He said, when I get there, you can give it to someone that you esteem trustworthy. Let him come with me to give unto those that are in need in Jerusalem. But the church today uses that. Let every man lay in store 
every week so he can come to their temple and give so that they can, you know, disperse it like they want and build the house that they want and what they see fit. It's wrong. So, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 5, we see... In Hebrews chapter 7, it talks about the law. Now, it says, um, The sons of Levi, were they, were, were they not commanded to take a tithe according to the law from their brethren? The sons of Levi. Well, Levi is the old priestly lineage. The new priestly lineage is Judah. That's what he talks about in Hebrews chapter 7. The sons of Levi, the sons of the law, was required to take the tithe. Not the sons of Judah. Amen. Because Jesus, of the lion of tribe of Judah, paid what the law required. Wow. Hallelujah. The law requires 10%. Not only 10%, but then it required a free will offering, a thankful offering, a trespass offering, a sin offering, to where, you know, a wave offering, thank you, Joe, there was five offerings, a trespass offering. There was five, I think it was. It might have been six. So all of these offerings on top of the tithe. And then, then it required an offering when you sinned. So if you transgress the law, my God, you had to be rich to pay what the law required. And the priest... The Levitical priests were getting rich. The Pharisees and Sadducees pranced around in robes and garments and all of the priestly attire. Because they was living now, they began to steal from God. They even began to eat the fat of the lamb and offer unto God the crippled stuff. Doesn't it now kind of sound like today? The priests, the so-called priests in the church of God taking the fat and offering the leftovers to the children of God. Because the, 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 the weak, the poor, the orphan didn't get the first fruits of, you know, no, the first fruits they used to adorn themselves with. The luxurity of what they desired and what was left over, you know, the shank bone went out the back door of the church, soup pots to feed the widow and the orphan and those that God really esteemed highly. It's exactly what's happened today. The law required payment of 10%, but grace requires faith to believe it's already been paid. If you owe 10%, well, then Christ didn't pay for it all. You understand that? One thing I... One thing I never wanted to deal with was money. I hate it. And, um... It really aggravates me because... Even this morning, the confirmation that came to me, 
was I dug in my pocket and I pulled out a dime. One dime's in my pocket. And the law, 10 is the law, requires 10%. And it was in my left pocket, not my right. And a man pulled up this morning that I was talking to and little did I know Mr. Rowland had, was raised in church. And he can't really talk real good and stuff like that. It takes a while for him to talk. But one of the things that he had said was that he was an elder in church. And he actually took care of the money. So there's no coincidence in God. And he said, you know, but I just don't know about all that this stuff, you know, because, you know, you go to church and, and all they want is your money. And it's a hard thing to do to talk about money. You know what I mean? Because it's, uh, it is so, it is so destroyed, the gospel of Jesus Christ, so destroyed it, that you can't even turn the TV on right now without a preacher mentioning in his message money and about funding his ministry. And that's why I never would put a name, my name, you know, you know, Robert Joseph Schubert Ministries. No. It's not my ministry. It's not my ministry. It's His ministry. It's Jesus Christ's ministry. And I'm just picking up where He left off. So how does, you know, how does it become my ministry when I put my name on it? But if I put His name on it, then I'm following under my head, and my head is Jesus Christ. And He came to do the will of the Father. And He came to build people. I didn't see him erect not one temple. I didn't see him erect not one building. I didn't see, and he was a carpenter. And he even said, I don't have a place to lay my head. He didn't even build his own house. Because if he had built a house, that house right now today would be a worship place. That would be the greatest house in the whole world. And everybody would want to belong to that church. Because that, this was Jesus' house that he built. And how many people are now saying that Jesus has built their house? No, you used Jesus' money to build your house. The purpose of giving now is because of a thankful heart. which makes a cheerful giver. Amen. Only when you realize that the full debt has been paid. How many people does it grieve, you know, to even go to church because they know the man's going to get up there to bless the offering and he's going to say, bless the tithe giver. Bless those who give offering and the people that are not able or condemned. They won't even come to church. People won't even come to church because they know when they sit down, an offering basket is going to be placed in front of them. It's going to be passed down so everybody can see if you throw something in the plate or not. And because of condemnation, not conviction because you're worried about the person that's on side of you you throw a crumpled up dollar bill so they can't see what it is that you're giving into the plate so nobody thinks less of you I might as well pull out a gun and hold all of you up right now and say give me your money because that's what's being done. It's a stick up. And because of fear of what people will think of you, 
people give what they don't have. Because of fear, they won't even go to church because they have to walk up to the front and cast their money in the plate and you're wondering, man, if I don't go up there and throw something in the plate, you know, the people around are going to see who gives and who doesn't give. Well, let's just hold up what you got so, you know, we can bless it and see what you're giving unto the Lord. So everybody hold up what you're giving. So everybody could see who's giving and who's not giving. So now, you feel condemned because you're not giving your tithes or your offering. But let's take a tithe. And hold on a second. Now let's take the free will offering. Well, hold on a second. Now we have a guest minister here. Let's take up an offering for him because we are thankful that he is here today. Well, hold up. Why don't we just take a trespass offering? How about we take up a sin offering? How about we just, you know, pull out the Tommy guns? And look, I've now installed a plastic card that'll accept you, that'll accept money off your credit cards, accept money that you don't even have now. So that you can give an offering. If you in that church, you better run. Because you don't have a shepherd, you have a hireling. And he ain't worried about you. He's worried about your money. And he's worried about what it is that he wants to do. And I'm going to tell you something. It's a shame because a majority of the pastors that do it don't even know what they're doing. They think it's right because of the law. Well, if you want to be under the law, the law of the tithe was instituted for the sacrificial system. And if Jesus' sacrifice wasn't enough, and I need to give 10% on top of what he done, well, what Jesus Christ done on the cross was vain. And your 10% won't save you. But there are people that believe they're going to heaven because I give my 10% every week. I give my 10% every week. They believe they're going to heaven because they give their 10% every week. And the only reason we're going to heaven is because of what Christ has done on the cross. Period. The purpose of giving now is because of a thankful heart, which makes a cheerful giver. When you understand that God has set you free from all of that. You are really thankful. What sin required. All everything that was in the law. You know. He paid for it all. So the purpose of giving now is because of a thankful heart which makes a cheerful giver, the ability to bless someone as God has blessed you Amen. by paying for your debt. Amen. The law required the tithe and much more than the tithe. Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 4 verse 15, you know, he talks about giving and the purpose of this giving um, 
it's actually it's a gift that has been given unto you and me so that we can give to bless others and Paul in Philippians chapter 4 said listen you know if he if if Paul didn't have the right to not by the law or the commandment to say to demand a tithe from you know the people then who are we to do it right but Paul in Philippians chapter 4 verse 15 you know um, he says I know what it is to be with and without and the church of Philippi blessed him through finances and he didn't require it of any of them none of them why because it's not required it's been paid you can read uh, Paul's uh, regards in giving in Philippians chapter 4 let's go to that real quick Philippians chapter 4 we're almost done Philippians chapter 4 I do have Philippians in here I think somewhere stuck between the pages somewhere around Colossians right Ephesians got it like it uh, Ephesians 4 I mean Philippians I'm sorry uh, Philippians this is Colossians that's all right. Maybe I'm. Sorry. Yeah, I got it. I was right there in it. Is this the easier reading one? Huh? Probably so, huh? Here it is, right here. Oh, you did have it. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urged uh, Udia and uh, these Greek names. Indeed, verse 3, with true companion, I ask you also to help these women, women who, have sh who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known unto all men, the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ finally brethren whatever is true and whatever is honorable whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is good of a good repute, repute if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise dwell on these things dwell on these things the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things and the God of peace will be with you but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me indeed you were concerned before but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances that I'm in. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things, through Christ that strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at my first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. So he didn't require none of them a tithe. Right? For even in Thessalonia, 
you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. Amen. You know? But I have received everything in full and have in abundance. I am, am amply supplied, having received from Ero, Ero, however you say his name, what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. What is he saying there? They met his, his, his needy head money financially. And Paul, in ministering the gospel, had pulled down the riches of, 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 of Christ and began to share it with them. That's why it says a workman is worthy of his hire. Right? So, it's uh, also there's some scriptures. Um, it says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, um, when Paul addresses the Corinthian church, it's about uh, giving to the saints that are in Ju Jerusalem because they're in affliction. It's, uh, Paul talks about in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, to, he said, listen, let you guys, you know, take up on the first day of the week so that when I come, there'll be no gathering when I'm there. This didn't institute the tithe giving of every week, go to a church and give you 10%. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 7, um, the Bible says, a workman is worthy of his hire. And then Paul comes back in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7. He said, I have preached the gospel unto you freely. 